set here. Thank you, everyone. My name is Dr. Emma Shapiro, and I am here to introduce to you the outstanding physical therapist, integrative nutritionist, and the CEO and founder of the Integrative Women's Health Institute. I hope I said all of that correctly. This is Jessica Drummond, and she is here to share her story of how she be basically transition from just becoming a physical therapist to all those credentials I just mentioned, and also how you can maybe get started in this uh, career field. So Jessica, do you wanna introduce yourself a little bit and then um, share your story of how you sort of discovered integrative nutrition and health coaching? Sure, thanks so much Emma for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. So we basically what happened was i graduated as a physical therapist in 1999 and i always thought i would be in sports medicine because i was an athlete as a kid and it was just a lot of what i studied and i did do that for a few years but found that i really enjoyed sort of women's specialty orthopedics so working with pelvic pain and pregnancy and shoulder pain related to breast cancer surgery and so pretty quickly i began to specialize in women's and pelvic health and i worked we moved a lot because so my husband was a consultant and I, but i worked for many years at the women's hospital of texas i worked at duke in north carolina i worked in a lot of specialty pelvic health clinics which gave me a lot of experience um, with patients but also with teaching and you know at women's hospital we had a lot of the top people at the time come and teach us when i was you know super brand new so that was lovely and then I, I had my first daughter. She was born in 2003, and I had my own personal health crash with that. Um, knowing everything I know now, which I didn't know at the time, so it took a long time to, to figure this all out, but basically what happened to me was I had a reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus during the postpartum period, which is actually more common than you would think. And so I had what was called adrenal fatigue at the time, um, a lot of hormonal imbalances, severe anxiety, fatigue, getting sick all the time, you know, every cold and flu, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I just, I was really struggling. Like I was so fatigued that there were days I was physically unable to walk to the bathroom. So I had to like quit my job. I couldn't even drive my kid to school. It took me about four years to figure out what was wrong with me. Yeah. So, but I did eventually, and that's how I found functional medicine because when we were, when I was at women's hospital <clears throat> down in Texas. So, you know, again, I had moved a bunch of times. I was living in Michigan and North Carolina, but we went back to Texas because my husband had a job there and we still had a small house there and I really was like a complete mess. So I, there was a doctor in Houston that we had sent from women's hospital, like all those patients that were like the difficult patients, you know, before we really were thinking biopsychosocial, we were just like, what is wrong with this person? Are they non-compliant? Is there something like really wrong with them that nobody can figure out? We sent all those patients to Dr. Gross in Houston. And I thought, I am totally a difficult patient right now. I'm sending all <laughs> to Dr. Gross. So <laughs> I landed in her office and, you know, spent about two years with her and her son, who's an ac acupuncturist and, you know, got better. It took about six months to get kind of back on my feet and then two years to get really, really healthy. And I thought, but most of it was done with lifestyle changes, addressing stress. I didn't take a million supplements. You know, it was really a complete mindset shift, nutrition shift. And I had been a vegetarian, um, but a sort of pasta vegetarian, <laughs> pasta <laughs> cookie vegetarian. So, you know, and not, but I was never overweight. So no one really, everyone was like, oh, your diet's fine. I always exercised. But, you know, and I was like swimming really hard so I could try to sleep, but because I had terrible insomnia, but I was so fatigued, but it was like just a big mess. I was like using all these tools, but they weren't helping me because I didn't understand the underlying hormonal imbalances and the triggers and the cause of what was going on with me. But slowly, Dr. Rose helped me figure it out. And I was like, you know, coming from a very Western trained background in physical therapy, I was shocked that nutrition could make such a big difference that, you know, cause other things started happening too. Like I used to have a lot of hand pain. I did a lot of manual therapy for 
years, like more than a decade. And pretty intense manual therapy too, a lot of spine work. And, you know, I'm a small person. I'm only like 5'2", 110 pounds. So, you know, I was working in with big people, pregnant women, back pain. And at the clinic, I had like those ice gloves, you know, those like soft oh, yeah. things that you can put your hands in. And I used to wear them like in, in between patients because my hands were hurting so much. When I changed my food plan, I've never had that pain again. Wow. So I was like, you know, this is shockingly effective. Um, and then I had, I got some, I had some patient experiences that were surprisingly effective, like a woman who was supposed to have a hysterectomy for her pelvic pain because they just couldn't think of anything else to do for her. And I had gotten her a lot better with pelvic PT, but she was still having this pain once a month. And I was like, I don't know, must be hormonal. I can't figure it out. And I said, you know what, let's just try this. But I didn't have a clue really at the time what I was doing. I was like trying to apply some of my own learning, but it was, it was extrapolated, you know, it wasn't really evidence-based. It was like, maybe this will work. And I was like, try not eating dairy and gluten and sugar for like one month. And that month she didn't have her pain. Wow. And she realized what was happening was we lived in Texas at that time and, and she had like Mexican food cravings every time it was her period. And that was like basically the only time she ate dairy, especially a lot of cheese. And then that was the direct cause of her pelvic pain. Now it's usually not that simple, but she was literally going to have a hysterectomy, which would have given her all kinds of other problems. And we had tried a whole lot of other stuff. So when that worked, I was like, oh no, I have to learn more about this. Like, this is crazy. So I started to learn health coaching. I started to learn more about integrative nutrition. I got a doctorate in clinical nutrition with a functional medicine perspective. And what I've realized in the last 10 years, kind of since that experience is that while the nutrition is a really valuable tool, it's like PT, like it's a, it's a clinical tool. It's a okay. physiological tool generally. What's even more valuable is coaching because you have to figure out why people aren't taking care of themselves. Like if they're all, if they're ready to take care of themselves, they will do the exercises. They will change their food plan without a lot of hoopla and they'll get better fast. And you see those people in your clinic, right? You see those yeah. people who go home and do their exercise. But that's like what, 15, 20% of our patient population? The ones that are honest with you, the ones that lie, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so there's that. there are some people who are ready to make changes and they happen to show up in your office at the right time and with the right motivation. But the vast majority of people need to understand what their bigger goals are. They need to have specific motivation. They need to deal with the fear of overcoming challenges. They need to deal with the lack of support they're getting from their families. They need to deal with all these other stressors. You know, I was on a call with a client just this week who was having a sleeping issue and she like brought me all this lab work. And I was like, all right, before we talk about that, you know, how much sleep are you getting? And she has a crazy job that's 24 hours. And I was like, you know, why are you working this hard when everyone in your life is telling you to work less? And she's like, because I don't feel valuable unless I'm doing it. And I said, well, could you raise your prices? She's like, oh yeah, I've done that. And I still can't get people to stop hiring me. And I was like, but I said, well, how much money do you need? And she yeah. said, mm, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. She was so afraid to look at it that, so, so these are normally the things that are the real problem a work or financial stress, a relationship stress, a fear that's kind of hanging on from childhood, someone else's fear or someone else's expectations of people. And this is why people don't do the nutrition and you know, everyone, you can read Oprah Magazine and know you're supposed to eat vegetables, not Oreos, right? I mean, <laughs> And, and, you know, everyone knows you shouldn't sit at a desk 14 hours a day. You should go exercise. You should take walks. You should go outside. Like, but there are reasons. There are compelling fear-based often reasons that people don't do that. So to me, the, one of the most valuable things we can learn is, be, is coaching communication skills, which is a huge toolbox that we don't learn anywhere else 
Uh, you don't learn it at all in, in Western medicine. And you don't even really learn it in integrative medicine because in integrative medicine, you're just learning different tools, right? You're learning turmeric instead of Advil. You're learning fish oil, you know, and, and that's better because at least you don't have the physiologic side effects, but it's also not as immediately powerful. So it's even more difficult to get people to comply unless you under you get to that deeper piece of the puzzle. Gotcha. Gotcha. It seems like, like, you know, listening to you, sometimes as therapists, we think we can always heal ourselves. And it sort of take it took this, like, this huge instance to happen for you to almost realize, wow, there's so much more we can do out there as therapists. And, and that's, that's really amazing. Do you, how much of a difference, I know you sort of highlighted a little bit just then, but how much do you think that integrative nutrition really helps with health coaching? Because I know we have a lot of mostly therapists listening on um, a lot of OTs, PTs, um, that's, you know, CODAs, PT assistants, that's a majority listening here um, that really want to get started in this, but don't really know what other education they need. So do you feel like having this extra nutrition is really, really beneficial for your uh, patients? Yeah, so I think as a career change, so so the other piece of my story is like, I really did kind of make a career change. I do still do physical therapy. I'm licensed in two states. I can do it. You don't forget. So, you know, there are things like riding a bike and I still practice once a week in a, in a small physical practice. Um, so I have my hand in it and I, and I combine that with coaching and nutrition, but I really did make like a career change in the sense that I don't go to a clinic every day. I don't go to the hospital every day. I have my hand in it a little bit, but no more than a couple patients a week. And so what that career change looks like in terms of education is if you get a health coach certification, which is where I began you can use nutrition and lifestyle medicine as tools. And I combine this whole practice, but probably like 90% of my patients now are not really patients, they're health coaching clients or nutrition clients that I do virtually via telehealth. So, um, you know, so I use my physical therapist brain, like there's no sense in turning that off, but I'm not really doing physical therapy on a daily basis. I can tell when people need physical therapy and then I have a referral network. I send people to clinicians all over the place because my clients, I mean, some of them are like in Singapore or Europe. And so I can't, you know, there's only so much PT I can do on the phone. Um, or even Zoom, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a health coaching certification, which were, which is where I began. And then I've always been a teacher. Like I started teaching continuing ed PT like the first year I got out of school. Within six months, I had a student. You know, I was always like teaching. That was natural to me. Fatima, my boss down at Women's Hospital, where I first took a big women's health job, had me teaching at CSM like three years post. Mm -hmm school. So it's just like, you're teaching this year, you know? So I had a lot of experience with teaching and I was so passionate about health coaching and nutrition that I started teaching that to physical therapists about 2010 and more formally in uh, 2014. So we have a health coaching certification now that's specialty focused on women's health, but I started learning. So that's what was my first kind of education is to get a certification in health coaching and it's much more formal now than it was then that was about 2008 or 9 and then now and then i went to get a doctorate in clinical nutrition because i wanted to write more books and speak more and and speak more at medical conferences and you know having the doctor after your name is helpful for things like that I did learn a lot in that practice from a functional, in that uh, program from a functional nutrition standpoint, but a lot of what I've learned in functional nutrition is also sort of self-taught and reading the literature and, you know, doing online trainings and working with colleagues who are just smart in little specific pockets of that. So I've put together functional nutrition training as a part of our health coaching certification because I feel like it's best if you have both um, because nutrition is one of those tools we can use as a part of lifestyle medicine. I think of lifestyle medicine as nutrition, sleep, stress is probably the biggest one, mindfulness, relationships, mind-body health, and movement or exercise. So 
physical therapy overlaps of course with movement but we're not exactly talking about like specific you know prescriptive exercise we're more talking about like getting people moving or not moving too much which in my practice sometimes that's an issue you know i have people who are amenorrheic or they're post uh, perimenopausal and they're you know really tanking their estrogen because they're actually over exercising they're kind of like burning the candle at both ends um so guiding that exercise piece is what i mean by lifestyle medicine of exercise so having more skilled training and nutrition um especially focused on women's health populations helps to round out that health coaching certification it's not always necessary to get a degree in nutrition although you there are about three good schools that do academic degrees in functional nutrition in the u.s and in some states with that not every state it's interesting nutrition license is very different from pt license some states don't license nutritionists at all some states only license rd trained nutritionists which is a quite different philosophy from what ha what i have although rds are there are many rds now moving into functional nutrition because it's so powerful um so they have like a you know how at, the, at csm we have those little like subgroups so yeah. in the RD, because I'm because I'm a licensed nutritionist, I'm like in the RD version of APTA. I forget what it's called right now. And they have a like a subgroup of nutritionists who are in functional nutrition. Um, so it'll it'll spread, but it's sort of new there now. And so some states don't license nutritionists, some only license RDs, and some license RDs and CNSs, which is what I am. Um, and so in Connecticut, I have a, a license in Texas. I don't, but I really practice, you know, from that health coaching perspective, either way, no matter which part of my brain I'm using, I'm always leading with coaching. So perhaps your recommendation would be, you know, it's sort of like with any business, minimal viable product, you know, if you're really passionate about this, you know, get that certification for just a basic health coaching. Um, and then, you know, see how much you love it, see the results of your patients. And then it almost sounds like finding your niche in women's health it helped you understand what the next measures you needed to take, like that you wanted to follow up with more nutrition and, and more functional medicine. So that makes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, can you talk a little bit about, cause I know we have some people that are really interested in women's health here. And please, for those people that are really interested in women's health, like we have like the pelvic guru here. So, um, so please like put anything you want to in the chat, but can you tell us a little bit about, um, the global online women's health coach certification program? Because I mean, you're very humble, but this is literally the only, um, sort of like approved women's health program certified by the, um, IC HWC, which is basically like the health coaching certification platform out there. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I went into health coaching already very interested in women's health, already practicing in women's health. And what I realized is that most of the best health coaching programs like Duke and Mayo Clinic and, and things like that are very generalist. So they're what they're mostly focusing on, because I did my original training at Duke, which was great, but what they're mostly focusing on is things like the most common chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, things like that. And, and just for anyone, you know, men, women, children, but being a woman that had had a hormonal dysregulation, you know, dysregulation basically, and kind of looking around and seeing that this population was sort of underserved, especially in the world of pelvic pain and, you know, female athletes and subs populations within women's health, um, perimenopause, menopause, osteoporosis. Those programs are worried about just like, honestly, most RDs are, because I've in many cases, like, for example, I went to go teach in Ireland one time at a PT clinic in pelvic pain, and I was teaching about this nutrition stuff. And they were like, I don't know, you're not an RD. Da, da, da. And they were like, you can't teach this. They were going to throw me out of the country. But, um, but they but they looked at all my slides and kind of got blown away. Otherwise, they would accept that they wouldn't let me talk about gluten. But that was fine. I'm like, there's lots more to talk about. Um, and I said, why don't you guys come? You know, there's so many patients here with pelvic pain. The PTs would love to work with you. Let's just look at this all together. 
And they wouldn't come because they said, we can't start seeing patients with pelvic pain. They're like, we are too slammed with diabetes patients and obesity patients and, you know, post heart attack patients. They didn't have a, the bandwidth to work with these women. So they didn't even want to learn it. Um, and, and I do see that a lot. So, you know, like I said, the other top health coaching programs do Kameo Clinic, some of the university programs focus on the most common chronic diseases and they, and they should, because, you know, these are big issues and they're very common issues, but no one else was really focusing on, you know, some of these women's hormonal health issues and women's inflammation and autoimmune disease and things that are also very common, but, you know, maybe they're just not as trendy or something. I don't know. <laughs> No, it's very trendy. You were just on the forefront because uh, there's another. Uh, I should have. I should have written her. Written her down to mention in this um, webinar. But there is literally another woman who calls herself the pelvic guru. guru oh, and she has, yeah. yeah, and and she's like huge. So I mean, this is extremely, extremely important topic. And I think, um, you know, one one of the questions I have is like. Do you feel like finding your niche in women's health, not like women's health is really a niche, you know, that's still really broad, but, right. but finding that, do you feel like that really sort of like enabled you to hit your stride as a health coach? Yes. I a hundred percent believe you have to have a niche practice or a niche, whatever you're doing. So even among the, the women's health practitioners that we graduate, so our program contains basically three components, health coaching, functional nutrition, and business, especially marketing and sales, because you can't have a, woman, a health coaching practice. You could get a health coaching job right from our practice, right from our program, because I live near Yale University and increasingly like big hospitals, Yale, Mayo Clinic, MGH, have health coaching departments, you know, you, you can, so you said ICHWC, it's actually changed its name now to NBHWC, but that's the, it's called the national board of health and wellness coaches. So that's like, not even just the APTA, that's like the board of health coaches. So you can actually get a board certification after you do our program. And so we have a lot of our students who graduate and then they go work for like fertility practices or physician practices. One got hired at an integrative cancer hospital, you know, so we do think you're, you're very legit when you go through this. Like I said, it was, it was very important to me to have that stamp of approval to be, we're among the top 20 programs in the world. And I, I feel really passionate about that. I don't want people, cause you can get a health coaching certification from like yeah. eight over the weekend, you know? <laughs> I don't think you're ready if you do that. I mean, you're ready to do something. You'll learn something. You know, you're an adult learner. You can enhance your learning, but it's not the same thing as the level that we're trying to get to. I want you to be able to deal with a woman who has endometriosis or severe anxiety or, you know, hypothalamic amenorrhea from overtraining um, or osteoporosis. You know, I want you really confident with your coaching skills. Infertility, we see a lot of that. So even within our community, um, before people graduate, you know, we have them go through some business training and I really suggest that they are very niched. So the more niche, the better in terms of the success of your practice. Um, and, you know, breast cancer is a good one. We have someone who's super niche uh, hysterectomy because of endometriosis. Um, you know, and then the sky's the limit. You can create retreats and, you know, uh, online programs and you can do one-on-one -on -one clients. You can do group programs. You can write books. You can be a speaker. There's so many things you can do if you, because not only are you, are you, is your marketing easier, but you actually begin to learn a heck of a lot about that topic. So over time, you really are an expert. You know, it's not just about the marketing. It's about really being able to serve the women that you're passionate about serving or the people in general that you're passionate about serving to the highest level. And that's why I'm so committed to the quality of our program and why it was unsatisfactory to me to just make it like a weekend or whatever certification.
No, I love that. I love that you brought up uh, two points. One, I agree hundred percent with the idea that you really have to set yourself apart. And I come, I come from like, I'm doing like websites and SEO these days, and mm -hmm. even from a ranking in Google search. So when people look these days, they're going to type it on the internet. And if you're yeah. the only one that's doing, let's say endometriosis, if you're the only one doing endometriosis, you could have no blog, nothing, but you're going to talk, you're going to be number one on Google search. And so if you want to actually start to set yourself apart as an expert, start to get clients, it's, you know, there's just a number of benefits to having this really unique set. And not only that, but I think like what you said, there's, there are so many different ailments out there and, and not everyone is being able to be treated. And so if you can find yeah. something that you're passionate about, like Jessica did, it, then you're actually really serving a population that doesn't have anyone else. And I mean, that that's got to be like incredibly good to be like this person spent years not being able to like get back to their life and you were the one to do it. You know, I think that that that's pretty neat. Um, but the second point is that just your program versus, uh, you know, just any of those other programs, because I see it all the time in our Facebook group. Everyone's asking what health coaching program should I do? And so can can you dive into a little bit more how like your program would differentiate versus um, just like some of those generic programs out there? Yeah. So the way to find the approved programs, and it is a rigorous process. Like my team and I had to put together a whole lot of things, track how many minutes we're teaching everything, like what, what our standards are, how we're testing people, what one, you know, how we teach them like one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Like you can't just kind of factory through this. So nbhwc.org is the oversight board. And if you go to approved programs, they've moved them all to the top now. So the, the permanently or, or highest level approved programs are at the very top. There was a transition couple of years. So we did that where the, the NBHWC was kind of putting itself together and just starting the board certification and seeing if it was going to take off. And because it was a surprisingly fast thing because a lot of people had to sort of come together and agree insurance companies and universities and private schools like ours. And, you know, there was a lot of like rigmarole to actually get this done. So it started about 15 years ago. So there's this transition period where there's a bunch of schools that got uh, approved, but now the standards are much higher. So look at that top group of schools. Those are the ones that are approved. And that's what I would pick among. Okay. Now, especially if you want this for a career. Look, if you're just trying to understand health coaching communication tools to use in your physical therapy practice, you can learn about that. You can watch on, you can watch videos on YouTube. You can take a weekend course. You can keep slowly just kind of learning a little bit more and a little bit more. And that will help. I honestly think of coaching sales as like the secret sauce to compliance, right? So that's going to help your patients actually executing what you suggest that they do. Um, or better yet, you and the patient really agreeing on what's the next thing they should do and them leading the conversation and you supporting and educating and providing, you know, specific physical therapy treatment. So you can learn the skills of health coaching through books and online and sh short courses. But if you really want this to be your career, the reason that we've created our program as such that we did is I love functional nutrition and think it's such a powerful tool. So we integrated that in our program. We integrated deep dive coaching and we integrated business training because I don't want people leaving and then not being able to start practices. Um, I'm, it's perfectly fine if you want to go and get a health coaching job. That's great, too, and well needed. Um, but most people in our community are really passionate about a niche topic and or they want to do retreats or they want to work from home they want to work flexibly i mean as a working mom like that's been the best part of this i mean i work a lot you know I, i'm not like part-time in this at all but i'm my my schedule is very flexible so i i work from home i mean right now we're in my house <laughs> and um I, you know, I, I'm on the road sometimes and traveling and teaching and I have one office here and one office in Houston, but my first office was like a three season porch on the back of a rental house. And then I built this big office, like in this gorgeous, like it was above the garage. We had reclaimed wood floors. We were, I was like envisioning yoga retreats and stuff. <laughs> 
And then all of my patients, because I was I were clients, I was living in Houston at the time, wanted to do work by phone because then they didn't have to drive there, save them all this time. Because we meet, you know, in, in private coaching, you meet about once a week, once every other week for a few months. So they were super happy they could just call me on their lunch hour. So it's a very flexible job. So as a as a mom of young kids, it was something I fell into. I didn't really do that deliberately. I did it more out of passion for the work. But now having been doing it for 10 years, I love the flexibility. That's awesome. I think that, that that's something that we really craved in today's society. Mm -hmm. um, just because, I mean, it can get hard. Like, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how you did that many years of clinical manual skills because after two weeks of, of my orthopedic clinical, I was like, my hand. So, so, I mean, working from home is, I think, something that everyone desires to do. And so it's great to see, you know, that, that you've really obtained a really wonderful lifestyle and, and that through health coaching. Um, now let's dive into, and anything important you want to, you want to shout out Jessica, do it at any time. Um, but I would love, I think people are really eager to maybe, you know, figure out the first step. So obviously you get your coaching certification, but then what sort of the, the route from there to go from like certification to first client? To practice, yeah. yeah. So that's why we teach business coaching. So in so my first step thing I recommend for you to do is really in full detail map out an ideal client. And it could be a client you've already served, someone you know, but like everything about them, you know, their name, their demographics, their problem, what it would look like for them to be successful, you know, because somebody with endometriosis, for one person, success looks like having a baby. For another person, success looks like not having to keep dropping out of grad school because they're in so much pain, right? And maybe finishing law school would be success, right? So think about for your ideal client, what is success? So maybe if you're working with female athletes, success might be um, making a division one lacrosse team or success might be, you know, winning the state championship, um, but without amenorrhea along the way, right? So, so, get really clear on who it is you want to serve because and choose something you're pretty excited about because building a practice is going to take a few years and the, you're going to be mo more quickly successful at it if you're committed to doing one thing what happens is is it gets a little hard and then people like start a podcast or <laughs> like you know, they change their niche or they open a membership site or they're like, they just do, you know, they start like selling random stuff. Like it, it doesn't like you got to stay focused on who you're serving and commit to that, which is super hard. I know, but commit to that for like at least three years because then you're going to be good. Remember, I told you like one of the most important things is being really good at what you're what you do. And if you keep building up the clientele and you keep practicing and you keep studying about, you know, overtraining or you keep studying about postpartum recovery, you're, you keep asking me questions. I have our once you're in the coaching program, you can come to our live calls forever. I have people who graduated in like 2014. I have one who came on our live call just today. She's practiced. She focuses on perimenopause and menopause. And just today she was bringing me a complex case to go through. So we're there to support you, but you need to commit to one thing. Now you can change your mind. Like one thing I did do, oh, this was a long time ago now, probably like seven or eight years ago. I saw like a hole in the market for my clinical practice. I really felt like, you know, we were waiting too long to serve women with pelvic pain that I really wanted to help teenagers with period pain so we could identify them earlier. So clinically, this all makes sense. Biochemistry, it makes sense. Biochemically, it makes sense. I was terrible at working with teenagers. I was never a pediatric PT. I sucked at it. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> you know, I was just not my thing. So you can try, you know, still commit to something for three to six months because you might just have a couple of clients that you don't click with. You know, that can happen. But if you really don't like it, you can change it. But commit for three to six months and then commit for three to five years to one niche. 
once you get 20 clients in your practice, then you can start a podcast. <laughs> then, you know, don't do anything but focus on getting clients for the first three to six months, and then your practice will grow, quick, grow quickly. You'll probably re replace your PT income pretty fast, like definitely within the first year, That's but awesome. only if you don't get distracted. Yeah. If you, which is easy to do because it's not super easy, which is why we offer a lot of support in our program because I, the hardest thing for all of my students to do is decide, you know, choose a niche and commit. Yeah, that's, that's so right on. I mean, when you're talking about membership and online courses, I'm like, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you're, you know, I, I think I think it's so hard because as a therapist and for all of you watching, you may get the entrepreneurial bug when when you get it, you get it. And it's crazy because you realize how, you, you know, you think you only have one skill and it may be just a PT or an OT or a speech therapist, but you're wrong. You have so many skills and you can use them for so many things. So I agree with Jessica. It's so hard because every single day you're like, oh, I could help this. I could help here. I could help here. And it's, but you're right. I mean, just sticking with that over and over and over again, but it's really refreshing to hear you say that you feel pretty confident and that you've seen the results from your students that they can pretty much replace their uh, therapy income, whether they be a PT or an OT, you know, with this, with this oh, yeah. practice. Absolutely. You could make more. It's just a matter of what if getting super clear on your niche and your goals. Um, it was something I was going to say. I lost it, but I don't know. It'll come back to me. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that is, that is awesome. So, so, um, talking about your first client, um, let's go into a little bit about like your setup and how do you even find your first client? Yeah. So you do, then you get, get out there and be everywhere. So my setup initially when I was working in the three season porch in the winter, by the way, with a little heater <laughs> was, so um, at the time I was, my niche client, client was someone who had struggled with hormonal imbalance after their pregnancy. So postpartum, kind of my own story. And what you do want to do is be on everyone else's podcasts. You want to speak. So speaking is the fastest path to clients in my experience. So you write a talk uh, about your story, about the, the, ideal result that the person would want to get the biggest problem that they're struggling right now. Like, you know, if I put myself back in my shoes of when I was really sick, I was so tired. I couldn't work. I couldn't be there for my kid. I didn't know what was wrong with me. There was a lot of fear. What I wanted was just, you know, energy and no anxiety and being able to go back to work and, you know, participate in my daughter's life. And so, being super clear about that and then mapping out the steps of how they're going to get there. And from a lifestyle standpoint, the first thing is that, you know, they start, you, you use the biggest needle mover. So they start to eat really healthy. They go to bed at nine 30, they drink more water. You know, you can't very simple tools that most people are not doing make a big noticeable effect. So you teach the, the how basically, um, no one's going to do it. Uh, you can write a book on it. You can give a step-by-step -step instructions. You can give a lecture. You can write a, record a video. You can tell people exactly how to heal their issue. Don't worry. They're not going to do it without you. And this is why. It, it took me a while to understand why they wouldn't do it without me. I'm like, why? you know, if I had this book when I was really that sick, I would have fixed this. But actually, maybe I wouldn't have because you don't trust yourself, right? That's why I moved to Texas to go like live a block from Dr. Gross. I needed her. She didn't tell me anything earth shattering, but she needed to tell me what kind of was wrong with me. I needed to understand it. And I had to make these changes. And if I was going to show up in her office, like every couple of weeks, you know, there's no sense in not doing what she says, right? So... So I, even I didn't do it, you know, even though I couldn't. <laughs> um, but I, I always think of it as this now, you know, let's say I wanted to renovate my bathroom. I'm sure there's a book, there's a YouTube video on how to do that. There's probably hundreds of them. I would never do that because I would be afraid that I would like, there would be water shooting out of the wall. <laughs> even if I started to do that, like 
I would panic and hire a plumber, right? So ex explain to people where they are versus where they you can get them to. Tell them even exactly how to do it. Some of them will try and then they'll get stuck and they'll trust you. So you'll you'll talk to them. And and the most the way we do sales calls in in you know health coaching and even clinical work is we do a real consult. We listen to the person's problem. We decide if we really have the solution or not. If we don't, we either refer them out or say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't really help you right now. Well, let me give you some resources. Or we take a stand and tell them, hey, I can help you. If you trust me, you know, in two months, this is what I expect. And if you're confident in your skills, which you will be if you do this a lot, because you'll have seen yourself be successful a lot. And the first time, you know, you may be a little shaky, but you have your, you know, our whole community is like standing there being like, you can do this. We all did this. Right. And then, then they trust you and then they do it. Um, so that's all a sales call is. And that's really what you do at first is you just talk to people, you tell them and show them exactly how you can help them. And you only commit to helping people that you realistically believe that you can help. That makes a hundred percent sense. Yeah. I mean, don't find someone that's got this mysterious thing that you never have, you know, for your first client that you've never treated and then try to treat that. That makes sense. And, and, you know, you're right. I, I feel like it comes down to accountability. Like I, mm -hmm. I just had a student and I was telling him the same thing is that a lot of, I work in subacute and it's not that challenging. Some of the things I do, a lot of it is just accountability. Me just being there saying you can do it. This mm -hmm. is what you need to do. And, and then they know what they need to do, but they just needed to hear your voice to be yeah. able to do it. Um, because they need to trust themselves. Like we're always a little afraid of stuff that we don't know anything about. So um, you're there to create this safe space. And that's what health coaching skills teach you to do. Create the safe space, ask the right questions, you know, encourage people in a way that that really touches them to believe that they can touch, uh, trust themselves. So that's really all it is. So it, once you kind of decide on that niche, you know, you can help people. The other thing people get afraid of is I'm going to be so bored just taking care of all people that are the same. You're not necessarily going to only attract people with the exact same issue. So now, I mean, I speak all the time on endometriosis. I wrote a book about it. You know, I, I'm pretty niched into pelvic pain and endometriosis in particular, although vulvodynia too. And, and a lot of times these things overlap, but still people send me their friends, you know, p other people find me that have tangential similar things. Sometimes it's not someone I really want to help or they're not really, I don't remember even how to do that. You know, it's like, oh, I've got COPD or something. I was like, uh, that's just irrelevant. But someone, maybe I helped the wife and then they send me their husband. So you can, you can say no or refer people out, but you don't really have to worry about getting bored because you are going to get other clients and you can choose to work with them if you want. Um, and I do sometimes, I mean, I had like a 11 year old boy who, you know, had Lyme disease and he needed to kind of change his diet to get healthier and more energized in the summer and then heading into middle school. So he, he and his family came and worked with me. That's super different from, a, you know, a 30 year old woman with endometriosis, <laughs> but it, it was referred to me and it made sense. You know, it was something I enjoyed doing. It was a great family. So you don't really have to worry about only, you know, getting bored. You're not going to get bored. Even if you have the same clinical issue, each human is so different that you won't get bored. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I find that everyone, everyone, you know, talks down sometimes about working in the subacute, but it's so different. It's every single day. There are so many problems. There mm -hmm. are so many problems. And so it's, I'm sure it's the same thing, even though it's, you know, a similar diagnosis everyone is just a little bit different and has a completely different problem. Sometimes I wish they were more boring. But yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, everyone, please, please um, ask any more questions Jessica has. I'm running out of questions. You're, I, I really appreciate you, Jessica, just like the honesty and, and just giving us every, like everything. You're not holding back at all on like any secrets on how to become a health coach. Um, I guess my last question is, what sort of like the top recommended like tools that you use to help um, be successful as a health coach? Um, I mean, you can start with just 
charts and paper. Um, but you know, usually you have some kind of an EMR. Um, you do have at least a basic website that you have certain lead magnets out in the world. So that means things that like gifts or booklets or eBooks or things, uh, videos or something that people are interested in to start getting to know you. So you do want to be from a marketing standpoint, you do want to be a little ubiquitous out in, in social media and local speaking, you know, rent a room at your library once a month and give a talk on something related to your topic, especially if you want more of a local practice, um, or be niche, uh, and, and start speaking on the internet more, build your own Facebook group. So like there are all these marketing tactics that make you practiced at teaching what you do. Um, so those are, you know, I use a lot of online tools in that sense, but you know, there are health coaches who use a lot of apps for tracking, like people track their food journal and, their accountability journals and stuff. There are a lot of apps that, that can work with that. There are several health coaches that have graduated from our programs. And in fact, one of our master coaches does this too. There are app health coaching companies that hire health coaches. Like so, Noom? Like yeah, Noom or the other one is I think Vita or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, we have several graduates who work for those companies and basically they're coaching people on the phone or by text or both who are using an app to track their progress. The app is this sort of accountability tool and then the human interaction you know, amplifies that. Um, so that's another job opportunity that you can do. And, and, and then also people that have private health coaching practices, some people like more tech focused things, you know, and, and in our world, there's a lot of period tracking, um, you know, uh, fertility awareness method, things like that. So people can track using, you know, digitized thermometers that link sync to their phone and stuff like that. So I don't use a lot of that personally, just, I think honestly, I'm 45. It's just not, it's not, it's just not intuitive to me. It's, despite the fact that I, you know, run a tech company. So I do do a lot of things online but I'm not, you know, it's just not first nature to me to use apps. Um, but you know, it, it is a tool that some people really like. Um, but you don't really need a lot of tools. It's, it's a pretty simple startup, a decent website, lots of ways to get your word out and then talking to people on the phone or by zoom meeting. Zoom meeting is something I use a lot as a technical tool. Definitely. Now, do you have to be HIPAA compliant? Um, I'm not sure what the regulations are for that. Um, yes and no, because health coaching is not really something reimbursable yet. Okay. Although there are category three CPT codes that just came out. So that may change. Usually payers only reimburse, um, category one. So you're a little more like a wellness practitioner. Um, so, you know, depending on how you're setting up your practice, you may want to set up a, a HIPAA compliant um, teleconferencing system, but, and I do use a HIPAA compliant EMR. We, I use living matrix sometimes. And then the other clinic I use charm. Um, but, you know, until you're like bigger, you know, if you have five clients, use your phone and a notebook and a website, <laughs> you know, and a awesome. 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 Yeah. And I think that's, that's the neat thing about, about health coaching. I really, I really wish I had more time to get into this because it's, it's so intuitive and, you know, zoom is so easy and it's, it's just so simple to set this up. I feel like, but, but I feel like the, the communication is where you're really going to set yourself apart. You being able to draw out your results. I think it's very easy to you know put up a website and and that but actually getting clients results is the challenge so i think that's really neat in your um program that you have those live uh talks those weekly talks just to like go over that because i i have bought courses before and I, i'll tell you everyone if you're going to buy a course buy something like jessica's because you can actually continue to meet with the person and get expert advice because that is 10 times more valuable, probably a thousand times more valuable than the initial course price. If anything, you're going to pay is to continue 
to meet with someone someone of Jessica's caliber. Well, Jessica, um, I know you have a book coming out, and so I want to sort of end because we don't have any questions. You, any questions? Last minute, please. Put them in. <laughs> um, but I know you have a book coming out, or or you're actually launching it right now. So do you want to share a little bit? Because I know I think we'd love to um, to help support you and to learn more about um, what you're gonna what you're gonna share. Absolutely. So the book is called Outsmart Endo. It's in pre-launch right now on Amazon. You can just go to Amazon and search Outsmart Endo and Endo, Outsmart Endo, and hopefully you will find it. <laughs> I assume that worked. Uh, it's in pre-launch right now, so you can get it for like 99 cents. Um, it'll come out in two months. I think January 14th is our official launch date. And we're doing a more feminine model aligning with the women's health world of launching. So masculine model is like, throw everything out there all at once, have a big party, load it, da, 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 da. <laughs> A feminine model is like, we're doing it over 15 months. So we'll have a print version eventually. I'm going to be doing a lot of speaking and book signings and be out there. And, and we also are offering right now an inaugural program, uh, the Endo Healing Accelerator. So, so practitioners, whether you're a pelvic PT or an OT or a CODA or a PTA, or you just want to become a health coach, because we definitely need coaches in this. Um, and a lot of times I found the most successful health coaches are people who had the issue and are now super passionate about helping other people. Um, we're doing an eight week program that starts in about a week and a half to just get people ready to take clients. Um, because every time I go and speak, you know, the biggest question is, well, where do I refer my patients who want to heal in this way because you're the only person who does this. And that's a little bit true. There's about like, you know, less than 20 people globally. So we're building an army of people who can take care of these patients using their own practice. You know, it's, it's your, it's your own thing. That's so awesome. That's like a really, really amazing opportunity. And look guys, you already have your first niche. Like that's tw 20 people only doing this. So so yeah. you know, start doing that. That's great. That's great. And any last, um, I'll share all the links in the Facebook groups and in the in the um, uh, recording too. I'll share all the links so you guys can easily find uh, Jessica's uh, stuff there. Um, any last information you want to share about your course or anything else? I would just say that you know I feel like our course is very strong because of the the personal touch. You know where we think of ourselves as more of a small school. Um, and the most exciting thing about it for me is the community. So just yesterday I got this awesome Facebook message. So there were these two women, Lisa and Vashti. We do these global, these virtual retreats to practice your health coaching skills. You have to go to three of them, but they're virtual. So I was actually leading one of these. So I met these two women. So Vashti lives in, I think, um, she lives in Africa. I'm blanking on the exact country. And then Lisa is a fitness professional who works in uh, Louisiana. And they met and they now are doing an online program together. Um, and they developed, so Lisa had to have explant surgery and Vashti was developing a program for women with explant surgery. So she's even like working with her as a coach. So her healing is going great. She's only like two weeks post-op and she's in great shape. Um, so, and then I had two other students, one was in Germany and one was in California and they did the live retreat in Morocco last year. So one of the most fun things for me is seeing these collaborations that happen within the community. So that's one of the things that I like the best. And then I would just say, you know, it's, it's, it's wide open as a successful field, invest in a good program that will support you through your whole career and choose a niche and commit to it. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Thank you so much, Jessica. You've been amazing. You've shared so much, so much information and just been, been so honest and upfront, which, which I really appreciate. And hopefully everyone on the webinar appreciates um, everyone. I'll put the links uh, later in the recording to Jessica's course, which is amazing. And her book as well. I'm excited to, to check that out. And um, thank you again, Jessica. We, we appreciate so much you being on here. I know that your time is so valuable. So we, we humbly, humbly thank you for being on here. <laughs> thank you so much, Emma. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thanks. Okay.